Well, good afternoon. Uh, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to our side event, uh, Delivering Clean and Efficient Energy uh, for People and in Buildings Through Digitalization. Uh, there are, of course, as you've seen, a lot of events taking place simultaneously. Um, and so it's a pleasure to, to see, uh, see you around the table here in this uh, slightly oversized room. We'll have to uh, you know, make some comments about that to the, the organizers, I think. Um, I'm Jonathan Sinton. I'm head of secretariat uh, of the Energy Efficiency Hub. The hub, uh, as most of you probably know, is a global government-to-government -government platform uh, where members help each other raise their game on energy efficiency. There are 16 members, uh, eight of the world's 10 largest economies, responsible for about 60% of um, primary energy consumption. I'll say a little bit more later about the, the work of the hub, which is co-hosting this event with the European Commission's Director General for Energy. Uh, but uh, first, we're here to talk about the role that digitalization plays in fostering the clean energy transition. Uh, just to focus for a moment on uh, my favorite topic, efficiency, uh, countries cannot meet their climate targets without radically improving energy efficiency, and particularly in existing and new buildings. For this, digitalization is essential. According to the IEA, digitalization could reduce carbon emissions from buildings by over 10% in 2050 compared to 2020. And by enabling those multi-directional flows of electricity, uh, of energy and data, digitalized user-centric uh, technologies, networks, and the business models to use them can bring about a more interconnected, a more secure, more uh, resilient um, distributed energy system. Um, but uh, crucially, and I heard uh, Meredith uh, raise this at yesterday's session on decarbonizing buildings, uh, people need to be part of the equation. I, I, think, I think that's how you put it. Uh, what difference uh, does it make to people's daily lives to digitalize energy systems? How can the uptake of digital technologies be accelerated, particularly uh, in buildings where people, most people spend most of their time? Uh, in a moment, to frame this session, uh, I'll, I'd like to welcome uh, Paola Pino, Director for Coordination of the Just and Green Energy Transition at the European Commission. Uh, and then after that, we'll turn to our panelists who represent a, a variety of perspectives. Uh, Brian Motherway uh, is Head of Energy Efficiency at the International Energy Agency. Uh, I'm afraid we've lost our speaker, uh, Luciano Martini. Uh, from the uh, from ISGAN, he had some awards to uh, well-deserved awards to hand out. I might add, and if they're not handed out by him, they're not really awards. Now, uh, then we'll go to uh, Ale Alexandra Maciel in in Brazil. Uh, she's infrastructure analyst with the Ministry of Mines and uh, Energy. Uh, we'll go back to Paula again, and uh, then finally to uh, Nanette Lockwood, who's senior director of Policy and Advocacy at Train Technology Center for Energy Efficiency and Sustainability. After that, we'll go to uh, a, a panel a discussion and time permitting, go to some uh, questions uh, from you who are around the table and who have uh, microphones in front of you. I'm sure you, you know how to use them and we'll use them well. This session is being recorded, so please be on your best behavior. The recording will be uh, available uh, next week. Without further ado, Paula, the floor is yours. Great to have you here, although this is the, the almost the end of a very packed two-day program, so uh, really a lot of appreciation from our side to, to, to have the possibility to share with you some, uh, some thoughts, and I hope this will be a bilateral uh, exchange of, of thoughts. Um, and I will start, I won't go directly into the digitalization, I will start with the energy efficiency uh, as such, and say that we are in our current context, and I don't like to use the, the word crisis, but, um, but the fact of the matter is that it is, we are in the middle of several crises. We had the first one, which is a longer term one, the climate change. Um, we are now facing more recently a, a possible energy security crisis, and certainly very much so in in the EU. 
which is in turn tri triggering um, a very serious prices, uh, uh, crisis. Um, and the interesting thing about this is that whichever you look and whichever you take, energy efficiency is part of the reply and of the solution to any of these three. And so um, energy efficiency should really be a, a no brainer. And, and I, I'm still and continue to be uh, puzzled. How come um, everyone across the world is not making more use of the potential of energy efficiency? It's really, really puzzling. And, and, and whoever has the answer on why this is so, uh, I would be very, very glad to hear from you. Because for me, it's still not clear. Why is it? Uh, when uh, we see that um, and you may know in the EU we have a target for 2030 of reducing by 55% the grouse, uh, greenhouse gas um, uh, emissions. And it's clear that, again, energy efficiency has an absolutely decisive role to contribute. Um, if only you look at, uh, 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 at the raw figures, uh, we say it could reduce contribute to lower our gas consumption by 30%, which is huge, bearing in mind the number two crisis of energy security and where we're really trying to look at every single BCM billion cubic meters of gas that we can spare, the potential of, of the contribution for, for, from energy efficiency is, is huge. Um, if you look, uh, of course, at what buildings uh, represent in terms of total energy consumption, in the case of, of the EU, it's 40%. Again, it's it's huge, and buildings uh, represent uh, one third of the uh, of the greenhouse gas emissions. So again, the potential there to do some work is is really really uh, big. Now we have in the EU uh, uh, set the regulatory tools. Um, actually, it's being negotiated now uh, with all the co-legislators. And everybody understood that actually we need to put more ambitious targets in terms of energy efficiency to deliver on the uh, climate change uh, challenge, but now also to deliver on the short term um, uh, big challenges that we're facing. And so all the co legislators understood actually this is the moment to increase and accelerate uh, the, the, the ambition. But at the same time, we have also identified. Uh, low hanging fruits, uh, which were reflected in um, what we call the EU save energy, which is what is it that everyone, every citizen, you and me can do to reduce our energy consumption. And of course, here we need to distinguish between reducing and making it more efficient, which are two different things. And it's true that we waste a lot of energy uh, anyway, but uh, it's the question also uh, reducing on the one hand, but but essentially, how can we make it uh, more efficient? And in this sense, um, you will not be surprised to see that in, in August, we adopted an emergency piece of legislation asking uh, all uh, the countries across the EU to reduce by 15% the consumption of gas. And last week, we, the European Commission put forward a proposal uh, uh, to, 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 to the member states to reduce electricity consumption uh, by 10% between now and the end of the winter. And there, really, uh, the idea is to seize all potential. Uh, so just to tell you how timely our discussion is, uh, is here, because we, we were speaking yesterday about the need for action. And I think here it's, uh, it's not, not just action, it's immediate action that needs, um, that needs to be taken. And with this, I, I do come to the digitalization aspect of it, because as part of our uh, objectives in the EU of making um, the EU carbon neutral by 2050, this means that uh, in terms of electricity and electrification, we will go. We will we'll have an increase of demand for electricity. Um, and uh, if you look at the figures today, electricity represents approximately 23% of uh, the final energy consumption. We estimate that by 2050, it could represent 50%. So 
again, we need to make sure that if we are increasing because we're electrifying and we're electrifying as part of our decarbonization efforts, that we are sure that this uh, increase will still be as efficient as possible and that we are really seizing all the benefits of, uh, of energy efficiency. And that's where digitalization comes in because digitalization really has uh, the power and the potential to uh, seize the efficiency gains that can be obtained in the whole of the energy system, in the whole supply chain from A to Z. Uh, if you look, for instance, uh, 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 the, the smart building technologies, as was mentioned already, and you mentioned, what is your figure for the potential of the smart buildings uh, reduction? Uh, it's over 10. Over 10 percent. Over 10 percent. Yes, I believe it's, it's coincides with, point something. with what we have. So big, big in a, a loan in smart uh, in smart buildings, if we manage to to roll them out. And when we speak of smart buildings is is uh, the building automation. It's the monitoring of the, the heating and the cooling, the hot water, uh, ventilation, and lighting, a number of things which can, can come very handy uh, to any of us, but also in, in the commercial buildings uh, uh, even more so. And through digitalization, we can really allow the consumer to become the prosumer and to uh, go from a very passive actor who is asked to pay the bills, uh, which uh, on top of it are increasing uh, at the end of the month, to a, an active uh, uh, participant who really decides this is the moment that there's more uh, uh, load in the system, so this is the moment for me to put my washing machine on, or it's not the moment because there's uh, scarcity. And I do hope that with these challenges imminent that we're facing, that a number of uh, 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 applications is actually being ruled, uh, rolled out. We're seeing, for instance, a, a, a member state uh, in France activated a very interesting application where you get an alert to tell you, well, there's, watch out, there's uh, too much uh, 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 demand going on. So if you can, please bring down your, your, your consumption. These are, uh, uh, simple things that can be already rolled out. So just to give some examples on the potential of digitalization linked to energy efficiency, and happy then to come back and say a few more words in particular on what we're doing in, in the, the Commission, where we are a few days uh, away from adopting uh, an action plan on the uh, digitalization of the energy system. So we'll come back to that. Thank you very much, uh, Paula, for uh, setting out the, the issues uh, with clarity and uh, with reference to the EU. And, um, and, uh, and your focus on efficiency, of course, is, is welcome. Um, the, the Energy Efficiency Hub about a year ago established its uh, digitalization working group. It's led, led by the US. Uh, I see Rob and uh, Meredith and Jack here. Thanks for coming. Um, so uh, about half of the half of the other members of, of the hub uh, are, are are members. So it is uh, um, uh, among the most uh, uh, well uh, or the has the most members among the task groups. Uh, it's a platform for members to learn from each other's experience and best practices, um, and it is a government to you know like the the other uh, task groups of the hub. It's government to government. Uh, what uh, can be learned from each other's successes uh, and and failures. Uh, digitalization group has just completed its its first uh, report. There's a there's a flyer at the other end of the table uh, that that summarizes its its results, uh, and it's it's downloadable from uh, the the hub website. And we'll have we'll have a live streamed launch event about it in in a few weeks in a few weeks time. But the report is available now for for download. Uh, the first topic that the digitalization working group chose to tackle was uh, was was buildings, um, and as this is uh, 
It's a, an analysis of the gaps both in technology and in policy and an examination of case studies from the participating countries um, in uh, how uh, things have gone in uh, some of their uh, earlier efforts. Um, and the idea of uh, this is a, a step towards uh, preparing a, a roadmap uh, for members or the, the sort of elements that each of the participants uh, could use uh, in rolling out uh, digitalization for, for energy efficiency. We'll hear a little bit more uh, about this uh, from Alexandra when, when, when she speaks. Um, and the digitalization working group is, although it's government to government, it recognizes the crucial role of the private sector and so has been engaging key uh, firms uh, represented here by, uh, by, by Nanette, so like, like, like Train, and so we look forward to hearing from you as well. Uh, now uh, let's go to the panel, and uh, Brian, I'd like to, to start uh, with you for your perspective on how digitalization can contribute to a people-centered energy transition. Thanks. Thank you, Jonathan. Uh, Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you to the Hub and uh, the European Commission for organising this event and inviting me to participate. It's great to be here, and it's great to mark this occasion collaborating with the Energy Efficiency Hub. Uh, we collaborate with the Hub and its, and its team daily. We're, we're delighted to host the Secretariat of the Energy Efficiency Hub at the IEA, uh, and Jonathan and his colleagues are doing excellent work. We're very pleased to be working with them. And of course, it's great that, led by the US, the first new task group of the Hub is on digitalisation, is already producing very good discussions and now very good outputs as well and so it's a very nice moment um, and equally Paula thank you for your leadership and for the leadership of the Commission and as you said in these difficult times the watchword is action but the watchword is also solidarity and I think what you're doing in terms of driving a European response to the current crisis in a firm action-oriented uh, way based on solidarity and based on, based on working together I think is really uh, important and impressive um, so like Parla, let me take the journey from efficiency first to digitalization. Um, we are living in, in a global energy crisis. Uh, obviously, Europe's at the heart of it, but everywhere is facing security questions, uh, price and affordability questions. Um, it's a difficult time to be an energy consumer, uh, and we need to recognize that that's causing a lot of difficulty. And I think it is putting a focus on the demand side that we don't normally uh, see in energy conversations and in, and in energy planning. Um, we're very pleased to be working with governments around the world on their responses. Soon after the Russia's invasion of Ukraine, we published two 10 point plans to help governments think about, first of all, how to reduce their reliance on oil and also how to release their reliance on Russian gas in particular, uh, with a focus on Europe and beyond. And of course, we're delighted, Paula, to be collaborating with you uh, and Commissioner Simpson's leadership uh, on the Playing My Part campaign, where we've worked together to encourage uh, consumers to consider what they can do uh, to reduce their energy use. Um, I think it is fair to say that that countries that are more efficient are more resilient to crises like these and, and, and the people who can meet their needs in terms of comfort and warmth and economic activity with less energy then of course are less vulnerable when prices go up and security challenges are faced. And I think that's a lesson well learned by many countries right now uh, who maybe haven't given the demand side the focus uh, that they should. Uh, and I think there is a lot of focus now on the demand side, both in terms of short term actions, which we know are possible and longer term structural change to our economies and our infrastructure and in fact just next week uh, we will be collaborating with many colleagues here uh, running a workshop online on what we're seeing around the world on best practice in behavior change campaigns in terms of of governments who are engaging with their citizens and in, in encouraging them to change their habits even slightly uh, to reduce energy demand as a whole and of course in particular at peak times which is a key issue in many parts of the world and as you said we've seen alert systems I think just in the last week or two we saw an example here in the US and California, uh, where there was an amber alert issued that brought down uh, peak demand by, I think it was two or three gigawatts within an hour and showing that that behavior change really does have a role uh, to play. And of course, the future of efficiency is rooted in digitalization. Uh, digitalization is really enabling new ways of thinking and doing around energy efficiency because it allows consumers to have much more control and information and understanding of their energy use. It allows them to, to uh, you know, optimize their energy use at home, in the workplace. It allows, you know, transport systems, uh, living systems to be 
much more controlled in a way that it adds to convenience and comfort, but also uh, does it more efficiently. But it's more than that because it also changes how we think about electricity systems. You know, the kind of the success we're seeing on the supply side in terms of the growth of variable renewables like wind and solar now need to be matched by a much more dynamic and flexible system. So, f so suddenly demand flexibility and demand side res responsiveness is a much bigger concept as part of our systems thinking about electricity grids of the future and therefore the concept of energy efficiency is changing in terms of how we think about its role and its value in terms of a future that is as paula said driven by both efficiency and electrification uh, and we'll see a lot of changes all underpinned by the really exciting innovation we're seeing in digital technologies and solutions uh, that are enabling all of that and Paula, I can tell you, uh, I've dwelt on this question for decades as to why I've singularly failed to get governments more excited and more <laughs> focused on energy efficiency. Um, and one of the issues that I think brings, uh, brings, make, brings the connection to the digitalization uh, uh, conversation is that certain supply side energy issues, without oversimplifying it, are in the control of the energy ministry in terms of, of, of in the old days, energy planning or in modern systems, you know, incentivizing renewables or looking at supply issues. A energy efficiency has always been a much more diffuse policy issue in terms of government ministries, but also the response of sectors uh, and, and people and businesses as a whole. And in 2019, we convened something we called the Global Commission for Urgent Action on Energy Efficiency. And there was a set of ministers and thinkers and, and, and academics to think about how could we accelerate quickly energy efficiency action. It's a, it's, the question is even more pertinent now than it was just three years ago. And their first and primary recommendation was we need whole of government responses to energy efficiency. Uh, and at the time, we did think it's not, it's not going to be an easy sell to get a whole of government response to get a primary ministers and ministers all excited and working together on the topic of energy efficiency. But two things have really changed that, and I think the potential has really changed. One is in the context of net zero, which is a whole of government uh, narrative binding glue that is really driving policymakers around the world. Energy efficiency we know is absolutely central and no path to net zero is going to succeed if it's not driven by energy efficiency, particularly in the early phase. And secondly, of course, the crisis now means that we have a discussion about energy in society and energy demand in society that really we've never really seen before and therefore an opportunity for political and policy response. So I think if, if there's ever a moment for a whole of government response to energy efficiency and therefore digitalization, we are at that moment right now. And that's why these conversations are really crucial to give policymakers the tools that they're now clamoring for uh, to take those actions that are necessary. And then finally, the third watchword in our title, which is people. Um, all energy transitions are for people and about people. And sometimes when we have conversations about technology and policy and fiscal instruments, we forget that all energy transition policies and all energy transition strategies need to be focused on their purpose, which is in to, to improve people's lives, to make sure that people have the energy they need to mitigate the worst uh, risks and effects of climate change, to make sure we're delivering transitions in a way that, that, that accelerate energy access progress, that support economic and social development, and and emphasize just transition, equity, inclusion, and other key themes. And in that regard, digitalization is a great enabler because it, it can open up new opportunities, as I said earlier, for people to be more comfortable and healthy in their homes. It's a really important area in terms of jobs and skills of the future, uh, and it, it's a really important enabler of making people's lives through clean energy transition actions. But of course, it doesn't come out without risks and downsides. And we need, when we talk about the really exciting opportunities come from digitalization, we need not to neglect questions like cybersecurity, privacy, and of course equity in terms of the digital divide and access to technologies and access uh, to the benefits of those technologies and therefore that also needs a whole of government response digitalization needs energy ministries talking to industry ministries talking to finance ministries talking to uh, housing ministries in just the way that energy efficiency does and that's why i think this unique moment in 2022 where we have two very very urgent imperatives around climate and clean energy and energy crisis security and price uh, it's the time for efficiency and digitalization to come together and offer solutions that are people-centered, equitable, and really impactful in terms of addressing the issues that we face. And that's why I think the kind of global
global collaboration that the energy efficiency hub is driving, the kind of work that the Commission is doing, and, and you know, supported by the kind of technical work, the really excellent work that the digitalization working group has already started and will continue are really essential ingredients of all of that. So really, we're very pleased and proud to be part of these discussions and looking forward to our ongoing collaborations. Brian, thank you for picking out the three crucial words in our very long title and uh, elaborating uh, upon them so uh, so well. I'd like to go now uh, to Alexandra, um, and joining us online. Uh, Alexandra, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jonathan. Um, good afternoon, everyone. First of all, uh, I would like to thank the Secretariat of the Energy Efficiency Hub for the invitation and for making possible my, my participation on, online today. Um, as Jonathan said, I'm from the Ministry of Mines and Energy in Brazil, working at the coordination of energy efficiency, and I represent Brazil in, in the activities of the digitalization working group. This is a young working group under the Energy Efficiency Hub, being launched in December of 2021 with the participation of eight countries, US as the leader in Australia, Brazil, Canada, Denmark, France, Germany, and Japan. Um, Jonathan already highlighted that this working group serves as a platform for the country members to learn about each other's experiences with digitalization and work jointly uh, to understand gaps and priority areas and also to identify actions to be developed. But why digitalization? Because this digitalization is creating new opportunities to optimize energy systems and decrease greenhouse gas emissions across key industries, such as power grids, buildings, transportation, manufacturing, oil and gas, and agriculture. As uh, Mrs. Paula Pinho has mentioned before, among these sectors, buildings are critical to address because they represent 36% of global energy demand, 37% of global energy rela related CO2 emissions. And when we talk about uh, electricity demand, it can go up to 50% of the demand. Uh, so, uh, uh, according to, to IEA, um, the, uh, it it's estimates that uh, digitalization could cut 10% of total building energy consum consumption by 2040. And many of state-of-the-art technologies um, are in the development phase and multi-sectoral obstacles to their large-scale implementation persist. So overcoming these barriers will require major developments through both regulatory and technological lenses in which we'll, we'll have to deal with privacy, cybersecurity, which is an important issue to address, interoperability, and data availability and analysis regarding electricity consumption. That is why the Digitalization Working Group developed some works that culminated in the report on digitalization for the energy efficiency of buildings operations, lessons learned from the Energy Efficiency Hub Digitalization Working Group. So this report is being launched now. Uh, so as mentioned before, it's been launched now in September and is already available in the hub's website. Uh, before that, a literature review was developed in February this year on large scale barriers and research gaps for digital technologies for building energy efficiency improvement. And in July, we had an interim report on policy and technological barriers or gaps. So in this report that's being launched now, um, technological and, the, and policy gaps could be identified and country policies or programs case studies were incorporated based on presentations and interviews made with member countries. 
Um, in case of Brazil, we don't have much concrete examples regarding policies and programs for digitalization in the building sector. However, we were able to share a very interesting study that was published here in Brazil, uh, in which we developed, uh, we, we've tried to establish a kind of roadmap for the adoption of different technologies according to different stages of the building construction, such as the design stage, the construction stage, and the operational stage. So it tries to connect which kind of digital issues are uh, more related to each of these stages and which would be the demands. Um, so uh, for us, it's been very fruitful to be a member of this working group because we can share experiences, learn with each other in such challenging field. And um, the next steps of the digitalization working group are very exciting uh, as well. Um, with the launch of its website next month in October. And in November, it's expected to be released a roadmap highlighting best practices and lessons learned uh, from the working group. So um, once again, thanks for the invitation to present this excellent work and I wish you all a good debate today. Thank you. Jonathan. Thanks, Alessandra. We may uh, we will come come back to you. There may be some questions directed to you, and perhaps you'll have questions for um, uh, those of us here. So uh, I'd like to uh, uh, turn uh, back to you, uh, Paula, for some uh, to delve a little bit more deeply into the, um, the the action plan without giving away too much before next week's launch, of course. Thank you. I'm sorry for being having to listen to me again but uh, so just as a, a small teaser appetizer for the digitalization of the energy action plan that I said we're, we're uh, bringing um, forward next week um, so the idea in the context is um, that the new technologies in terms of digitalization really open new perspectives on how we manage the whole energy system and uh, be it from uh, the way we produce energy to the way we consume energy, but also on the way between the, the production and the consumption, the whole infrastructure and how can digitalization uh, come in. So if it's true that uh, it can help us uh, really, as I had given the example before of, of uh, managing our, our electricity bills because we have uh, a active a uh, tool that it, uh, allows us, for instance, through smart meters, to know exactly how much I consume when, and 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 how that relates to the to the production and availability of the electricity in the grid. It allows me to go even further if we have, and this is the first element that I would disclose uh, in terms of pillar of the of this digitalization uh, of the energy action plan, which is crucially data access and exchange. So how can we make sure that all this wealth of information, of data that is being produced uh, when uh, electricity is being produced, but then also when it is consumed, um, how can we make sure that we make something out of it uh, valuable that can really be to the benefit of, of the consumers? So data exchange, so first of all, it's about having access to the data. Then the second step is exchange the data. And the third one is, of course, to analyze the data and know then how to best use it uh, for efficiency, uh, efficiency gains. But here there's a whole, whole set of work that needs to be done to make this possible. And needless to say already, the, the very first question of uh, the access to data is very sensitive. And not everybody is keen on having God knows which companies having access to my data in terms of how I go about the consumption of uh, electricity uh, in my home. So you really need to build uh, a context of trust uh, in order to have 
uh, the citizens adhering to it. And Brian, you mentioned people, people. You can, again, you can have the best policies in place if you don't have the citizens adhering to it and they adhere, if they trust, then you can uh, simply forget about it. So already this first element is one that provides us with a lot of, uh, of work. The second is, of course, you have to invest. So investments in smarter and more digitalized, uh, digitalized systems are absolutely uh, uh, crucial. Uh, and then it's very interesting when you start looking into uh, what it actually means. And of course, uh, very quickly we came to big amounts uh, investing in the digitalization of the energy system uh, and we look into very concrete examples and there was for instance uh, an evaluation which was done in in a city in in germany uh, and uh, they put together these two co different costs how much does it cost to provide for uh, smart charging which allows me to decrease the my demand and they say, well, would require about 2 million uh, euro investments in smart uh, charging, compared to how much would it cost to reinforce the grid to cater for an increasing share of electric vehicles uh, in the city. And that would be 20 million. So you always will need to put into perspective what is it that you need to invest, but as opposed to uh, the cost of non-investment, to achieve the same uh, result. And then you're already a bit more reassured. But so investments, a very uh, a key pillar of this uh, uh, action plan. Third, but I already mentioned, and it should be actually overarching, is the, 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 the citizens and the need to empower the citizens, the need to create the, the conducive context for, for trust. Uh, uh, and this means information, a lot of information. How, what does it mean? What's in there for me as a consumer in terms of the efficiency of smart appliances? If I'm giving my data, what is it that I'm getting in return? And again, this has to be underpinned by a lot, a lot of communication information. And at the same time, uh, guaranteeing that uh, the, the, the data that I'm disposing of will not be abused, that there is a regulatory framework which will provide for confidentiality, for privacy, and so that uh, uh, my data are being used but not abused. Uh, then uh, a, a fourth uh, element is, and we came to the other side of the coin, one aspect of the digitalization are the opportunities it brings, but then the other side of the coin is the challenges uh, that it, it, it brings. Um, and, and here, as Brian mentioned already, for instance, the question of uh, the cybersecurity, because of course, the more, uh, the, the, the broader the surface of electrification, the more exposed we are. So obviously, we will need to tackle actively and proactively these uh, risks in terms of cyber. And that's another uh, big uh, element that we're covering uh, in, and, 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 and uh, identifying what exactly needs to be done uh, to cater for this risk. A fifth is still linked to the challenges of digitalization, which is that we're talking here about the potential of digitalization for energy efficiency, to seize the potential of energy efficiency, but guess what? Uh, the whole uh, 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 digitalization per se brings a lot of increasing consumption of energy. If you take, for instance, the ICT uh, sector, which represents really uh, a, a very a big share and an increasing share of electricity consumption. Uh, and think of the data centers, for instance, which are due to become amongst the biggest consumers of, uh, of energy. So how do you go about this? And again, here, how do you really make sure that, uh, for instance, the, the, the energy used in data centers can be uh, reconverted, used in district heating, for instance, how can you um, uh, ensure some circularity in terms of the uh, uh, data of the electricity uh, use? So here we're looking, of course, into eco design requirements in making sure that we have uh, the tools to make sure that, for instance, uh, electronic display, uh, dis uh, uh, displays have an energy label, which 
can tell you as a consumer what is the consumption of this electronic uh, uh, device. Uh, we're working, for instance, also on energy labeling for computers. Um, so again, that to provide as much as information as possible to the consumers so as to allow them to indeed take informed choices and have uh, a say, uh, a, a, an informed say when they make their individual um, uh, choices. So five uh, key pillars of this uh, action plan. And if you want to know more, very, very soon you will be able to do so. On Wednesday, this should come out and I hope it will be uh, followed by a lot of communication and I count also on you. Uh, with your respective counterparts to to make the best of it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Paula. Um, certainly, I'm, I'm, I'll be tuning in, and uh, probably uh, <laughs> a whole lot of people uh, around around the world, um, because this has significance uh, not just for the the, the EU, but uh, mm. and for, for neighboring countries, and really uh, setting. Um, an, an example, um, but of course uh, the, the the challenges are not just for policymakers. Uh, it's important to have clear leadership from the business and, and financial uh, community. And um, so, uh, Nanette, I'd, li I'd like to go to you since we've lost our utility speaker as well. Perhaps you could talk a little bit about the utility perspective as well. Oh, I'll be talking about utilities for sure. So, hi, thank you very much for inviting me. I'm very excited to be able to represent all of the industry, and uh, <laughs> I'll be speaking for them at any moment. Um, but we are uh, Train Technologies is a very large multinational company, and our business is heating and cooling buildings and transport. So we do it all over the world. And we have been a what we call a climate innovator for a while because we've been doing climate commitments. And so the first one we finished uh, early. So of course, we made a bigger one uh, in 2020. And that is to reduce our consumer or our customers emissions by a billion metric tons by 2030. So as difficult as that sounds is as difficult as it is, I can tell you. So the first thing we did is start digging into data because we needed to understand what we were selling our customers. And then we had to figure out where we were selling it. Not all climate zones are equal. So we created climate zones around the world to try to figure out the impact of energy because heating and cooling systems represent about 40% of the energy from a building. So we're part of the problem, we get it. So we're trying to solve that. So now not only do we look at energy efficiency because that immediately reduces emissions, but we also look at the carbon intensity, the grid, because not all grids are created equal. And our biggest challenge is that those um, hourly emissions rates by utilities don't exist. They're not, they don't even know how to calculate them. Some of them do now. Uh, most of them won't talk about it. So we buy that from a third party provider and they don't have it for all the grids. But if you don't know how, what the grid looks like and you're trying to decarbonize a building, how do you assure the building owner that they're getting what they're paying for? You really can't. We have all kinds of technologies out there today. We can do demand shifting through energy storage, through thermal storage. And that basically says you're going to use most of your power consumption at night during base load. Well, that's great as long as base load is lower emission. So there are technologies out there today, and uh, the General Services Administration just put out a report from the Green Proving Ground that talked about the building controls will save you 10% of the energy. And it will reduce your costs as a building owner by up to 12% annually. So that's a big deal. Building controls are a must. But if you're in the building controls business and your goal is to reduce emissions, what do you need? You need, building, you need data from the grid, but you also need to communicate to the grid. And when you're communicating to the grid and you're, you're opening this dialogue, you basically are introducing what we call demand response, right? You wanna be able to help the grid. You're treating the building as a battery. You wanna help facilitate the reduced, you know, consumption of energy as well as the reduced emissions. And demand response from a utility perspective is heavily discounted. 
because they view it as, well, it'd be nice if it's there, but we're not going to be sure it's there all the time. So we're not giving you a lot of credit for that. So we need demand response to be considered capacity. So all utilities have to build enough infrastructure to be able to, you know, meet the hottest hour in 10 years. And so that's their capacity. So if you consider what we're putting into buildings and treat it as capacity, that will then give the building owners more incentive to pay more for more efficient equipment. We've been building more efficient equipment forever, but most building owners will go to the most, the minimum that they have to meet by law because the energy codes are such that there are minimum thresholds. And so what we're looking for is performance-based guidance to the building owners. We need performance-based standards, performance-based codes, and there has to be a carbon metric, and that drives the need for more data so we can empower, to your point, the consumers to be prosumers. I'm gonna start using that term all the time. So it's important to give them the data. We don't have all the data. We need the data. It has to be safe and secure. But we feel like everyone's waiting for the next best technology. The technology is here today. We have all kinds of examples that we could share about building owners who are willing to do more and really kind of aggregate because it's, it's great for one building to do something. It's even better if you're aggregating the buildings so that you're creating a bigger battery for the grid. So as a technology provider and, and our peers are doing the same things. You know, we're really, we're trying to sell this to the consumers and they're seeing that initial price tag. They're not seeing the cost benefit. Mm -hmm. And so we need regulators to step up and help us sell that concept to consumers. Energy efficiency has been around for a long time. It's now coming back, um, unfortunately, because of the politics, but carbon is here. Everybody has targets. If we don't start measuring carbon, how are we ever going to know if we meet those targets and we're never going to do it without data so we can provide you all the data you want to, but we need more data as well. So, thank you, I look forward to the discussion. Well, thanks, thanks very much uh, and. Uh... Uh, speaking as somebody who spent some years at a, at, at a national lab uh, and uh, being data driven, very much uh, aligned uh, with that. Without uh, data, uh, we're kind of dead in the water because we're looking at policies that are creating value, that are essentially, you know, in a, in a fashion, printing money. You got to print it well. You have, have to make sure that the value uh, is, is there. Uh, so, uh, thanks for your uh, initial uh, uh, remarks, and uh, let's go to um, a, a few questions. Um, I'd, I'd like to uh, start off with, with one before I ask you to ask questions of, of each other. Um, and uh, it, it's clear, I mean, we're, we're here because, uh, because a collaboration uh, across national borders, across sectors is, is important. Uh, but in the arena of digitalization, you know, the, uh, where is collaboration uh, essential? Where should we be focusing um, our, our, our efforts uh, right, right now and in, in, the, in the near future? Uh, Nanette, you, you mentioned uh, uh, data, uh, of course, so I'd like to hear you elaborate a bit more on that, but uh, Paula, maybe we'll go to you in terms of your action plan. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, uh, I imagine that in some ways you'll be uh, surveying the horizon to see what efforts others ha have made mm -hmm. uh, to um, uh, to take action or what they're thinking about now. So, what what issues are sort of rise to the top in, in your thinking about that what, that you'd like to learn about from others? Well, one, one issue is interoperability, right? And standards, standardization, which we will need, um, which comes up also in other areas, but uh, here it shouldn't really be underestimated. Um, again, uh, and that also leads to then the possibility to actually compare 
uh, the data. Otherwise, we're comparing apples with pears. So very important. Uh, as again, it's not just the availability of data, but it's the availability of data based on a, a harmonized uh, methodology. So very, very critical. And that's where I also see a big uh, potential for cooperation but well beyond borders, well beyond the EU in this case, and really for international cooperation. Uh, so, uh, and, and uh, across the board between governments, between industry uh, also, uh, uh, not to happen as we had in other sectors where today in the 21st century, if I'm coming to the US and I want to charge my iPhone, I still need an adapter. Uh, and the same if you go to the to, to to Europe, you still need an adapter. How come? I mean, we need to this time uh, address the issues up front and ensure really uh, interoperability would be a key word I would let uh, down here. Great. Thank you, Paula. Uh, thank you, Paula. Uh, Brian, uh, same question here. Um, we work with governments around the world on these questions, and I'm struck about how similar the issues all countries are facing on these matters. So I think just a simple act of exchange of best practice is really important here, because the question, the question policymakers uh, like Paolo want to know is, okay, that's great, what do I do? You know, so, so what are the actions, what are the policies available? And many countries, all the countries represented here, Brazil and the Commission, US and many others, are all doing interesting things. And when you bring it all together, it gets an incredible pool of knowledge of what works, what doesn't work. And as I say, for digitalization and efficiency more than many issues, there's, there's more in common than in difference. And I think that exchange is important. Uh, and I would also, um, very much agree with Paula's point on, on you know, standardization and harmonization. And I'll just mention another initiative of the Energy Efficiency Hub, which is also an initiative of the Clean Energy Ministerial and the IEA as a coordinator for, which is SEED, the Super Efficient Appliances Deployment Initiative. Uh, and it is looking very much at that question around harmonization of standards, harmonization of methodologies underpinning standards, so that we can understand the context of, of appliance efficiency on a global level, both learning in terms of policy, but also and how we measure it and so that appliances can be traded and that there's an advantage to efficient appliances being traded and we're doing some regional work for instance in ASEAN helping them to think about harmonizing standards so that the most efficient appliances can thrive in that market and I think that that whole question of working together is really important yeah great thank you Alexandra I'd like to go to you you mentioned uh, the roadmap uh, for ad adoption of uh, digital technologies in design, construction, and operation of buildings. But uh, what would you choose a, as a, as an area where uh, uh, collaboration would be important for Brazil? Well, um, I think that study uh, helped us to understand um, more about other stages of the building when we talk about measures of energy efficiency and also about digitalizations we are all uh, regarding buildings we are always thinking about the operational stage of the building and we could under, we could notice that uh, the design stage is very very important to in order to uh, be more effective in in the performance, in the energy performance of the building. And uh, regarding the design stage, there are um, several uh, tools and digital tools that can help us to integrate uh, energy efficiency strategies into the design. And the BIM uh, methodology is very, very strategic for that. And I think um, it would be a very interesting opportunity to, to share ideas about how to integrate this way of thinking into the design, mostly because uh, we, can, we notice that um, when we are talking about buildings, um, it's very, very important that the design is well done from the beginning, because if not, we are going to, to be just fixing um, uh, what we already have. And for that, we have to start thinking on how to 
to integrate these tools and to integrate this way of thinking into the design, not only uh, considering um, the, the heating needs for the building, but the cooling needs for the building. Um, and now we can notice that in Europe and in other uh, high latitude countries, um, they are needing more and more, they are suffering more and more with the heat. And um, I, I, I can tell you that um, there are very, very simple ways of integrating uh, measures into the design that can avoid a lot of the heat loads in the building. And I think we should be discussing these um, uh, um, regarding the, the building sector. Thank you, Alexandra. And uh, Nanette, I'll pose that uh, to you. I'm going to make that very quick because I know we're running out of time. So I do agree with all of it. Uh, but what I would say is I think the, the most immediate concern is existing buildings because we know that new buildings are easier to change and implement. We've been doing that for a long time. Uh, performance standards of equipment is important. But when you start getting into existing buildings and retrofitting, it's very complicated. And the EU has that building performance directive um, for energy that is a, a really great approach. And I'm really hoping to really great effects for all of the member states, but it's not something we focused on really elsewhere. And so if we don't address our existing buildings and the data and, and some of the issues that we're seeing are really the baseline. How do you even measure how it is today versus where you want it to go? So even if you had building performance standards, where do you start? So I think that is, is absolute immediate concern. Right. Well, on, on that note, it's, it's interesting to be uh, you know, living in Paris now where uh, existing uh, apartments are given uh, ratings. Uh, right, right now. So there is already um, sort of a policy-driven uh, emerging practice. It may not be perfect, but there's certainly uh, experience there that can be used uh, to to uh, to build on. Uh, I, I think perhaps uh, I was a little bit over ambitious in uh, thinking about our time, but uh, we had a really uh, rich uh, discussion, really excellent contributions uh, from from our speakers, and I particularly I appreciate your response to this uh, last question about highlighting issues for collaboration that we could uh, take forward, some uh, appropriate for the digitalization working group, others uh, uh, appropriate for, for other uh, fora as, as well. Uh, I'm sure the IEA will be continuing to uh, grasp the central questions of, of the day going forward as, as well. Um, so uh, I, th I think uh, having reached the time, I think all that remains is uh, for us to, to thank today's uh, speakers here and in, in, in Brazil and uh, look forward to uh, seeing you again soon and uh, working in the months and years ahead together. Thank you. Thank you, Alexandra. Thank you. Bye-bye.